See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. I love the topic here, healing the healers. What's the toolbox? We're encouraging our frontline people to find their joy. Just imagine your mind and your body and treat it like your phone battery. Why wouldn't you use everything at your disposal to try to recharge, to bring back that empathy, to fill people's figurative tanks so that they can start giving the best to their families, to their friends, to their patients? If I had a magic wand, I would want all of humanity to be compassionate and be loving and kind so that no matter what we were facing, we could face it together. Hey, See You Now listeners, Shauna Butler here. In this episode, we're sharing part of our adventure at the Aspen Ideas Health Conference held in the stunning summer mountains of Aspen, Colorado. Known and appreciated for bringing together a wide range of experts, activists, and leaders for pressing conversations, Aspen's 2023 themes of health, society, and our economy place the health and well-being of clinicians at center stage. Working in healthcare is a full contact sport, taking a toll on every dimension of your body, mind, and spirit. Recognizing this, clinical leaders and executives are testing support and wellness interventions to boost emotional health and tame the widespread stress and exhaustion that intensified during the COVID-19 pandemic and continues to strain so many. Clinical staff are reporting remarkable improvements in morale and motivation from these creative approaches that focus on healing the healers. To hear what's working, let's jump into this well-attended panel discussion led by Professor of Medicine, Executive Director of the Empathy Project at NYU Langone, and Chief Medical Correspondent for CBS News, John LaPook. Thank you very much. And hello, everybody. I love the topic here, healing the healers. So we're going to go to my left, down the line. They're going to introduce themselves. I always find that's the best way for you to know who people are. So go for Great. it. Great. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name's David. I'm the CEO of Calm. For those of you who don't know Calm, I've always explained Calm as a company that uh, we want to be with you every step of the way in your mental health journey. And we really have focused uh, our first two programs around sleep and meditation. And by focusing on that over the last 10 years, we've had over 400 million people touch the product globally. Uh, we've had over 130 million downloads and growing. And I'm really honored to be up here and to be talking about this important topic today. Thank you. My name is Winnie Mealy. I'm a nurse for 42 years. I'm the director of perioperative services in a community hospital on Long Island. I'm part of Northwell Health, 21 hospitals, 86,000 employees, 18,000 nurses. And I'm here really to support nursing. And I, first of all, I'm honored sitting up here with all these important people. <laughs> I have a lot of stories to share. I was on America's Got Talent with the choir. And um, music is a healer. Thank you. So my name is Eric Way. I'm an emergency physician by clinical background. I serve as the Senior Vice President, Chief Quality Officer for New York City Health and Hospitals. It's the largest municipal safety net system in the United States. We treat 1.3 million New Yorkers, often the most vulnerable uh, communities and, and patient populations. Uh, I oversee the Office of Quality and Safety, which includes our Arts and Medicine program, our Workforce Wellness, our Helping Healers Heal program that I started in Los Angeles and brought to New York. But most importantly, I'm the, I'm the lucky guy who gets to sit up here and talk about the amazing work of the collaboration between the Lori M. Tisch Illumination Fund. Lori Tisch, Rick Lefglass, Kira Pritchard are here, Jan Rothschild, and then our lead for our arts and medicine program in New York City Health and Hospitals, Larissa Trinder. And so I'm just the one who's telling you about all the amazing collaboration and work up here. Thanks. And Wendy, you're a nurse, correct? Correct. So I, I find it so interesting that you're talking about, you know, being up here with all these important people. You are the person uh, yeah, who we nice. admire. Um, and my, 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 my mentor said to me, always listen to the nurses, and now I've passed that on to the interns when I say, 
when a nurse calls you at three in the morning and says, the patient doesn't look good, that is the end of the discussion. Do not spend the next 10 minutes trying to talk her out of her instinct. So I want to start with you. Um, we're going to spend this much talking about the problem because I think everybody here knows what the problem is and this much talking about solutions. So talk to me about the solutions that you see and, and uh, how did that segue into uh, America's Got Talent? So as a frontline leader through the pandemic, we never had to tap into helping our people as much as we do now. I think for me, music is healing, absolutely, in my home life as well as my work life, and we were given this opportunity. The story behind it is long, but the story is that these 18 nurses from 11 different hospitals who didn't know nothing went out to California to sing one song, and it just blew up exponentially. We sang at a magnet conference for 7,000 nurses, and every nurse in the audience was crying. And we were crying because we had this connection. And so now we see how now we're all together and we all need help. So for me, uh, the people that I serve, my staff, we have a tremendous amount of opportunities, just like NYU, Northwell, we all are aware of the need for the code lavenders and the resilience and the financial support, spiritual support, emotional support. Everybody suffers in a different way. So we need to be able to feed into each person what their need is. And the one thing I want to say during the pandemic, we all put our joy away. And so we're encouraging now all nurses to bring back whatever it is that makes you happy, whether it's knitting or singing or traveling, because we shut down for so long that I think that was a big problem, yeah. is that we were not doing what brought us joy. Because when you are a nurse, you give it all, you go home, you find your joy, you bring it to work. It went away. And so for us, we're encouraging our frontline people to find their joy. Get we, it back. Eric. Uh, where, where do you come from in terms of this issue? And, and, and you know, tell me why you're involved and how you're involved. Yeah. As you said, John, uh, don't need to tell people the problem. We're, we're burnt out. I'm burnt out. Everyone in this room is burnt out. The pandemic exacerbated uh, all of that. And I think what we lost is, is human connection, is being human again, humanism, right? So why wouldn't you use everything at your disposal to try to recharge, to bring back that empathy, to fill people's you know, figurative tanks, right, so that they can start giving the best to their families, to their friends, to their patients, right, that we're, that we're serving. And so uh, when Lori and Rick came to us early after Dr. Katz and I came from Los Angeles, we, we were facing huge issues, $1.6 billion structural deficit on a $6 billion you know, annual budget. All the smart consultants said you need to sell hospitals, close hospitals, uh, fire staff, right? And imagine how the staff were feeling with this big, dark cloud over them. And so Helping Healers Heal is the first program we brought, but Lori and Rick came to us and said, hey, did you know you have one of the largest municipal art collections in the country, 7,000 pieces, dating all the way back to the WPA in the 1930s, and 55 of those WPA murals still exist in our hospital? Why don't we show some love and, and leverage that, that collection, but also layer arts and medicine programming on top of it. And so our community mural program, which we're gonna, there's a little gift uh, from Lori to all of you as you leave, uh, was born out of that, the lullaby project that helped new moms, Carnegie Hall was the partner on this one, write their own lullabies for their new babies. Um, the Heart of Medicine Art Observation to build empathy, communication. Uh, we have an artist in residence working on gun violence, so working with our hospital violence interruption programs. And so all of these things added together, together with our H3 programs, together with having care experience and workforce wellness under the same umbrella. You know, why should a CQO care about this? Why should a CEO care about this? Taking care of your staff so that they can take care of the patients is gonna bring higher quality, safer patient care with a better care experience. So a theme is emerging, right, which is what's the toolbox? So we have music, which of course is in the toolbox for pretty much everything on the planet. Um, uh, and then we have art. And then David, talk about your tool there. Sure, sure. And, and ours is centered around, it's really centered around taking a break. You know, so for so many of us today, I think in the world that we live in, um, and you said it well, we know the problem. And what I would tell you is the way I've looked at it sometimes is 
how you communicate in terms of taking breaks. So sometimes people will take breaks in terms of like how we sleep, how we want to meditate during the day. And I often tell this to my own children who are 16 and 13 who don't take breaks uh, during the day. And I try to speak in their language. And I said, just imagine your mind and your body and treat it like your phone battery. You tend to stress out when that gets below 20%. You run around to every outlet that I've ever seen. <laughs> You ask strangers to borrow their power cords in public <laughs> places, right? And if you just treated your mind like that and took a quick break when you didn't feel as good, whether it's singing something, whether it's taking a moment to draw something, we could actually make ourselves feel a little bit better during the day and not a little bit worse. And so those are hopefully some of the tools that we want to bring. And just they're simple tools. And with that in mind, we actually have a demo just about 90 seconds of a film to show you what he's talking about. So we're going to play that. Make for yourself every day. I don't know if I would make very much time for myself. I'm constantly going. I don't like to be idle. If I have a down moment, I'm helping somebody else. Do you mind if I share something with you that hopefully will help you find a little more peace every yeah, day? Yeah, sure. Would you like to do I'd that? I'd love to. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes gently. We close our eyes just so that we can limit our distractions and any noise from the outside world. Just take a couple of deep breaths. And out. When you're ready, in your own time, at your own pace, you can gently and softly open your eyes and just be present. And those few moments that you did spend in stillness today, how did they feel? They felt worth it. I have one last thing I want to show you. Sure. Rest oh. I can't think of anyone who deserves to take time for themselves more, and I'm so proud to call you my wife. Mm. That was very nice. <laughs> how are you feeling now? Just to sit there in stillness and focus on it and not be thinking about everything else, that feeling like I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it. Put that away. I feel like that's the most I've sat still for a while. That's great. So I can guarantee you that her oxytocin level, the feel-good hormone, the nurturing hormone, went up when she saw him. It's actually been shown. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, it, go, it really goes up with a hug. And I think uh, I, we, we do have a national uh, hug deficit right <laughs> now, right? The pandemic and other reasons not to hug. And so I think our, our collective oxytocin levels are down and we need to think about how we, how we connect more to bring that up. Just to put this in perspective, I, I went to medical school when, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, okay? And in March of 1981, uh, I was a newly minted intern and I thought I was gonna save lives. And I saw my first patient with HIV AIDS. And then every patient who I saw for years with HIV AIDS died. For years, and then there were pills that made it more of a chronic illness and Fade Out, Fade In, I was watching The Normal Heart, a play by Larry Kramer. At the end, they have names of people who died on, on the wall of the, of the theater. And uh, everybody files out, and I'm sitting there in tears. And I turned to Kate, my wife, and I said, I think I have PTSD. At no point in my training did anybody talk about how I could heal. We had no therapy. In fact, it was, you know, snap out of it kind of thing. These are the days of the, in the days of the giants. You know, we went up snowy hills and we worked for 27 days in a row and all that. There is a different mindset now, isn't there? It is generational, I will say, in the boots on the ground. You know, when I started working, we staffed by guilt. You know, we don't have anybody, when do you have to stay? Now when I ask somebody, Amy, can you stay? She said, well, I'll stay, but I have hot yoga at 4.30, I gotta go, <laughs> right? So we never did that. Like, we just worked till we fell down and then we came back the next day. So we're learning from the younger generation yeah. that this self-care is such a big part of our survival. We just, like you say, we just never learned anything like that. So one of the things that nurses complain about is time. I don't have any time for my family. I don't have time to meet with my friends for a glass of wine, you know? So, like you're saying, we have to find the time for whatever it is that Absolutely. brings us joy and brings us back. Uh, but I do think the younger generation is getting it. I think they understand how important self-care is that we never got. 
So time is an impediment. There are structural issues in healthcare that make it tough to stay well. What are some of the other impediments, David? Yeah, well, I love the thing about time because we've seen that too in a lot of our own reports because we also have to remember that you know, our clinicians today, our nurses out there today, they're caring for somebody else throughout their entire day. They don't have a minute to themselves. Then they go home and then they're caring for someone else. Um, and so that actually kind of never stops for them. So it's almost like an endless cycle. And so we all, often have to remind ourselves how we often take and need to take breaks for ourselves. We also have to recognize from just our work environments how to create that type of work environment where you get the space to take time for yourself. And so that may mean as folks who run the systems to say, how can we create a positive work environment where we actually encourage people to take a break um, and it's okay to take a break or it's okay to raise your hand to say, you know, I need to take five right now. And we recognize there's a lot that's going on at work and there's, uh, it never seems like we have time for ourselves in the moment, but it is, uh, it is so important for us because half uh, of the workforce that's out there today, and I think one of the Harvard studies showed that in March of 23, it showed that our doctors, our clinicians, our nurses, they're burnt out, most of them are ready to leave, and they all feel overstressed and overworked. If we don't solve this now, this problem is just going to get worse and worse over time. And so we need to go do something now together going forward. And that's but, why I think senior leadership, uh, leaders, boots on the ground, leaders like myself, we have to make it happen. Where are the people that are going to free up the frontline workers to say, you got 15 minutes, you go, I got you, or yeah. sign somebody else? Because it, if everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything, okay. I believe that it's a leadership role, at least in my department. I have to make sure that the managers are managing our people and taking care of them and giving them that time. Because you could have a beautiful lavender lounge, but if you can't get anybody down there, yeah. it doesn't help anybody. Yeah. You know? So Eric, do you sense that, that on an institutional level, that there's an acknowledgement of that, and then there's some attempt it's a tough issue, right? Because you've got that need to just do nothing with the fact that you're seeing patients every 15 minutes and there's, you got five people and there are 20 people in the, in, in the emergency room and on stretchers in the hallway and blah, 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 blah. So they're brushing up against each other, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. The, the staffing shortage, the financial pressures of inflation, you know, paying for agency nurses and, and others. But it, in our system at New York City Health and Hospitals from Dr. Katz, myself on down, this was our first priority. I still remember having, having a, my first meal with Mitch in New York City in Chinatown over wontons, right, debriefing my initial meetings, and I said, wow, they need H3 even more than Los Angeles, and he said, I absolutely agree. So whether it's second victim, compassion fatigue, vicarious trauma, moral injury, all these things have, were going on before the pandemic and exacerbated uh, by it, but the whole thing is that we go into healthcare because we're healers, right? We give patients and their families our healing powers all day, every day. But the culture of medicine, the house of medicine was actually cruel in, t in the sense that we weren't allowed to give it to each other, right? It was a hazing, it was a, a rite of passage. You need to toughen up as a, as a resident yeah. so you can survive. Nurses eating their young, yeah. right? And so- Horrific, no, it's horrific. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. And so, right, talking about, right, uh, meditation, like I haven't done, you know, official meditation, but there was this change when I came to New York from Los Angeles. I would show up to work, like stressed out, anxious, angry, and I couldn't figure out what it was or something different. I didn't know if it was a new role, made a mistake. And then I realized it was the New York City subway system. <laughs> <laughs> like talk about the opposite meditative <laughs> experience, right? And so I actually missed that 15 minute drive to the hospital because that was the calm, no pun intended, mm -hmm. before the storm of getting to work and being bombarded, right? And then having young children at home, I think all the parents in this room can relate to this. It was a calm before the storm at home, right? Uh, and so just having music, having some quiet, if I didn't want it to be quiet, in my car alone, right? And I didn't have that here. Uh, and so I started walking to work so that I could. <laughs> well, uh, talking about those, those moments of calm, I mean, people talk about the pajama notes, right? People writing their notes at night because there's just no time during the day. You're in your pajamas and you're writing the notes. I have to bring this up. I know this is not a, a discussion of AI, but I did just participate in, in a chat GPT demo where a PA spoke to me and had the iPhone right there. And uh, it was the latest version. And she took a history 
and she was looking right at me the whole time. And at the end, and I threw in some extraneous, I made up some symptoms and I threw in some extraneous stuff, like I was in Australia and I hurt my knee to see, it had nothing to do with the history of the present illness, see what it would do with that. And when we were done, it had taken our history, wrote a pretty good history of the present illness, knew that the Australia thing was on the side, to put that under extraneous. Uh, there was like one or two little things that needed to be corrected, which she did. So uh, what, if that really works, obviously there's a lot of danger, Will Robinson moments with AI and people are worried about it and we have to use it as the tool that it could be and there are pitfalls. But is that something, have you, have you even talked about that uh, yet? Uh, yet it's absolutely, we have an AI committee thinking about all the ways that we could leverage chat GPT and, and AI. I've been to the Epic conference where they've for years showed uh, the progression of Hey Epic, so similar, right, uh, PCP visit and Epic's taking notes in the background, but I think it's a big piece of it, right? I didn't write on my med school application that I wanted to go and spend 75% of my time charting, especially at home in my pajamas, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's taken the joy out of the work for a lot of our clinicians and a lot of our nurses. Like I spend three minutes actually interacting with a patient, I spend seven minutes charting about it. That's not bringing joy. And sometimes something as simple as telehealth. Picture you're a nurse in the operating room scrubbing on a case. You're scr you're all day you're scrubbed. You don't have any time. So you either have to call in sick, you have to take a sick day. So when you have the ability to use telehealth, you can go during your break or you could go at lunchtime and talk to your PCP about whatever your issue is, right? So something simple like that is already changing how we support our people. And again, I truly believe that it's a leadership duty to take care of their people. And we need really good leaders. And of course, that can help on a health equity level too, right? Yeah, For the people 100%. who don't have daycare and they, they don't get, can't yes. afford to lose work and on Everything and on. Everything becomes stressful. That's what yeah. happens, you know? Yeah, and you, have to have a, and you have to have a conversation around it. So I think, you know, being in Silicon Valley, this conversation obviously dominates uh, a lot of discussions today. And I think for the leaders today that don't have the conversation around it, it actually can cause more stress. Um, we've seen with our own teams, um, some people uh, jumped on it very quickly and they started prototyping and putting things together. And then other teams were like, wait, will that, will that, is that going to affect my job security going forward? Mm -hmm. And in a way, what we had to have was a dialogue around how it could create more efficiencies and help people. And so maybe that's another way uh, in terms of it's not really about, you know, job, you know, you're losing your job and it's more about how can we be more efficient in our jobs going forward. And so there, there are many different use cases of it today. Um, we've got a lot of different prototypes, as you said, but one of the biggest things is just have a, have a conversation around it um, because I think this conversation is not going to go away. If you read a lot of the nurse engagement surveys that as leaders we get, nurses want to be seen, they want to matter, they want to know that they matter. You know, like the pots and pans in New York City, you have no idea how positive that was for all of us. People outside banging pots and pans, it was a validation that people saw what we were doing and they appreciated what we were doing. So how do we let our nurses know how much we appreciate them? Anything we can do because they want to be seen and why they want to know that they matter, uh, it's important. You know, we had an epiphany at the Empathy Project, you know, so the, the Empathy Project is basically we create Hollywood quality short films to help clinicians become more empathetic and compassionate and listen and uh, empower patients to demand that, right? And um, at the beginning, we were thinking about where well, we're educating clinicians and training to be more empathetic towards their patients. But then we realized after a number of years that we really have to have a component of being empathetic towards each other. And it was not intuitively obvious to us at the beginning that that was something that was so important. But um, how do you help uh, make that something that's just, you know, that's just part of, of the, the modus operandi of, of how, how we do things? I think, you know, kind of repeating what, what Winnie said, it's leadership modeling that behavior, right? Getting up and sharing your most painful second victim stories, showing compassion and empathy, the way you react to adverse events and, and root cause analysis. Um, that's a big part of our Helping Healers Heal program is that leadership needs to model this behavior so that it makes you go vulnerable, you're vulnerable first, makes it okay for others to, to be vulnerable as well. And then just the, the pots and pans, you know, taking us back to, to some yeah. of the darkest days in, in New York City. 
I remember on one of my ED shifts at Kings County, so after a morning of level loading patients across our 11 hospitals, I went in, I'm working shifts. You know, I have a lot of friends. My sister works in Hollywood. I'm like, they could not over-dramatize this any further, right? This is Armageddon, the end of the world, right? Three intubated patients, each slot, the PZD, everybody intubated, right? You're waiting for patients in the main ED to crash so that you're gonna intubate them. And there was a lady with a psychotic break who was kind of being ignored because everyone's doing codes and intubations and she's singing church songs, right? And I'm like, oh my God. And then that multiple times that shift going outside, just pulling the mask down so I could catch my breath, like fight back some tears and go back in there and intubate somebody else. And I called my boss, uh, Mitch, the president and CEO of New York City Health and Hospitals. I'm like, Mitch, I don't know if we're gonna hold up. I don't think we can hold up uh, to this. And when I got home, I got out of the car and my next door neighbors were all sitting on the stoop and they just started clapping, right? Oh. And, and that was like one of my lowest moments, right? This is before the pots and pans. And just them that I didn't even know that well, right? Giving a, a little bit of applause, like, okay, like that's who I'm fighting for. This is my community, right? I can keep going. And then if I could just share one more thing, I'm, when these uh, music heals, something else we realized in our staff that it seemed like in those early days, everybody who went on a ventilator did not come off a ventilator unless they were dead, right? right? Nobody mm -hmm. got extubated. Nobody, nobody went survived, home. Yep. Right? Nobody went home. And so when we had our first one, it was such like a, a big celebration across the system mm -hmm. that we thought, hey, we play a lullaby every time a baby's born. Can we play a song every time somebody's extubated, right? And each hospital chose its own song, right? Bellevue was the, uh, the sun is coming. Um, but Jacoby NCB chose a uh, fight song by Rachel Platten. And my daughters were five and three at the time when I told them. I told them every time somebody survives COVID, the virus, uh, we play the fight song, right? And so they wore Alexa out, like hours on end, <laughs> playing the fight song, because in their mind, every time they said, Alexa, play fight song, somebody lived from COVID. And, just talk, and then just seeing our staff dressed like astronauts, dancing, hugging, right? Mm. Celebrating that little positive news with music, um, just, it really drove it home. What we asked of our staff was almost impossible to even get your arms around, you know? The not no visiting, no family, holding an iPad so the daughter could watch the mother expire and saying to the manager, don't hang up, I just wanna be with her. And so the manager's got this thing and she says to the daughter, tell me about your mom. Tell me what made her such a great mom, right? We, we were never trained for something like this, right? It was so crazy. And she talked all about her mom and as she's talking about her mom, her mom passed. And in 10 minutes, there was somebody else in that spot. It's crazy. So, so there are solutions, yeah. small and big, right? We yeah. need, we all acknowledge we need structural changes. Those are things that sort of like one person, you know, working a shift can't really do. That's administrative, big picture, right? But then it sounds like what we're saying is there are also little points. Think of a, a Surratt painting, you know, and da, 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 we're going to do this thing and this thing and this thing. And then you, it's not a broad brush. You step back and go, oh, this is a more empathetic, kind, what environment that promulgates and promotes wellness. So with that in mind, I'd love to just go, go down and talk about specific, those little points. And Wendy, you, you, you talked about the lavender um, alert, right? Code lavender. Code yeah. lavender. Yeah, so um, any, talk about that, because I, I, mean, I suspect people went, hmm, code lavender, what's yeah, that? So at any time you, as a, st as a uh, healthcare worker, feel that you've been traumatized, it doesn't matter what it is, you have an opportunity to call the cold lavender. And when you call it overhead, there are people assigned in the building to come to you to help you address your issue. So I was in a cold lavender a while ago. There were two young boys um, from Huntington who one fell in the pool. He was uh, special needs and his brother went in to get him and they both were on the way to the emergency room. So they called the operating room. We went, set the bays up with anesthesia in they come. We worked on them for over an hour. And as soon as we, they were pronounced, we called a cold lavender. And so you have social work and you have a, a whole host of people that are trained and we immediately got in a circle and we wept as a group and we talked about like, this is one, probably for me most, one of the most horrific things I've seen and it was just about sharing because when you share something that you've lived through with someone else, it just makes it better. 
right? And we shared and we talked about it. And so a cold lavender is like on the spot, let, let me help you with your trauma. And then Northwell has all of these opportunities that we can get you involved in. Employee health, um, what's it called? EAP, employee assistance programs. And so as each person starts to share their issue, social work and them try to identify who are the people that we really need to grab and get them because we need to come back. Mm -hmm. You got to come back tomorrow, yeah. right? So uh, a cold lavender has been, they even have cold lavender lounges, as I said before. Um, and as leaders, we got to get people down there to use them. So again, to point out the difference between that and how I was trained, I mean, we never had that moment ever. And that's why 20 years later, I'm in tears. And I think, you know, had we had the addressing it on the spot and at least an acknowledgement that this thing existed as opposed to just snap out of it, you know, see the next 27 patients. I think what's amazing, John, to build off of that is in, in New York City Health and Hospitals, we have the commitment of GE, GME, all the DIOs, uh, Residency director. You know, tell people what GME will teach. Uh, graduate yeah. medical education, so resident physicians and training. This is the hardest thing. I went through the hardest thing any physician goes through. Um, we have commitment that they're all going to be trained as uh, H3 peer support champions. Mm -hmm. Hours of training on empathy, debriefing one on one, debriefing as a group, looking for signs and symptoms of burnout, of second victimization, knowing how to refer to tier three, right? Not everybody who loses a patient needs to speak to a psychiatrist. But saying we give you health insurance is not good enough, right? You call the number on the back of the card, yeah. right? It's not good enough. No. So it starts with naming it as a problem and then the tools. And uh, David, talk to me more about the tools that you provide. Yeah, and a lot of the tools uh, that we use today, and, and, I'll, and I'll back up a little bit, is we've talked a lot about time. And there's just not enough time to take care of all the people that are raising their hands. And so people are overworked and overstressed. Some of the things that we've tried to do at Calm today is to basically say to the folks who are probably on the lower end of that acuity curve, to say, you know, you can come to us. There are other techniques you can go use. They don't have to be 15 minutes. They can, we built things because of COVID and because of different demographics. Some of them are five minutes. Some of them are 90 seconds. They're pretty short in nature. So it doesn't become uh, this big investment that you have to put in. So when you look at then folks who were handling at the lower end of the spectrum of that acuity curve, so if you're raising your hand now and you have more serious mental health issues or MDD or SMI, you may then, then actually the nurses and the doctors can focus on them. And so there has to be technology used in a way that can really kind of go one to many and so that can help you be more efficient in the process. And so those are also some of the things that we're focused on today with some of our products. So let me do this, because I want to go down the line. Um, after uh, we do this little exercise I want to do, we're going to have a Q&A. So start thinking about your questions for the last 10 minutes. If I wave a magic wand because, and I give you absolute wealth and absolute power over all things in the universe, okay? <laughs> what does that fantasy program look like that you would love to see implemented? Fantasy Pro, I love, okay, great. Fan, th uh, think big, think big. I love it, I love it. Actually, it's something I said in the beginning and I'll start with my own kids today. Um, and I think it will bleed into some of what we're seeing with Gen Z, which is many of them today are raising their hands and they're more proactive. We've seen it, 70% of them have raised their hands to say, uh, you know, they're, they're much more comfortable around the dialogue around mental health. Uh, as opposed to some of the baby boomers, we've seen about 40%, about 35% of baby boomers will raise their hand and ask for help today. And so there's a stigma that still exists even though we talk about this. So if I were to wave some of these things around today, I would want that we've come so far in making the language and dialogue around mental health that much more approachable. But, but we have so much more to do. Uh, Calm is a global company. We've been uh, downloaded in over 190 countries. And I can tell you it varies once you go outside of the United States very greatly. I just came back from Asia because I was celebrating my grandmother's 100th birthday. Ah. Um, and I would tell you there, they don't talk about, I, it pains me a little there because I want it to be more talked about, but still culturally, it's not acceptable to talk about your mental health needs oh, sure. uh, in Korea and Japan and in many parts of the Asia. So it's not... It's not as accepted. And so I would hope if I were to wave a wand around that we could make the dialogue around mental health much more approachable uh, for everyone all over the world. 
All right, no more stigma. No more stigma. Okay, that's one. <laughs> okay, I have a lot of things swimming around my head right now. A magic wand? What? Yeah, yeah, go for it. <laughs> I think you no matter know. where you are or what you do, I think that we all have to have the same basic desire to take care of each other. I think the compassion and the ability to uh, connect with people, like I'm a big fan of leadership. I know my people, and when one of them is suffering, I know what they need. And I think, I think about after 9-11, uh, I had my husband and family members caught in that, right? My husband has stage four cancer from 9-11. Mm. We were so kind to each other after 9-11. I mean, we're on the subway and people were smiling and hugging. And then same thing after the pandemic, in the hospital, kindness and love. And then for some reason, I don't know, it just kind of goes away. So if I had a magic wand, I would want all of humanity to be compassionate and be loving and kind so that no matter what we were facing, we could face it together. So I definitely agree with Winnie in terms of bringing kindness and humanism back into healthcare. Uh, we've lost it, right? And we need to bring that back. We need to be kinder and more empathetic towards each other, towards our patients, towards the communities we serve. Obviously, I would want all the staffing shortages to go away and the number of things on everybody's plate by at least 25 to 50% in, in technology, AI, uh, could help us with it. But concretely, I think every program needs to have, or every hospital, hospital system, every clinic should have a holistic wellness program. There's eight dimensions of wellness. There should be resources that the staff are telling you they want and need that are available and invested in, and leadership is investing in it and seeing it, the importance there. Uh, and I think we should leverage all the humanities. Everyone should have an arts and medicine program. And John, I know we talked a little bit about how hard it is to measure these things. H3, right. Empathy Project, Arts and Medicine. We are seeing some data on it, right? We've seen our staff on the employee engagement surveys from year to year go up by 20% saying, I feel like the organization values me, mm. up by 12% that the organization respects me. Burnout has decreased by 15%. And this is all staff surveys that are telling us so that you know, we're starting to build the data for it and then we need to put the return on investment on it. We don't not have time to do this and we don't not have the money to do this. We can't afford not to do it. Yeah, I, I love that. And I would just say, I think naming it, as I think is something that's been a theme here, naming it, it says to people in the institution, okay, it's important to the powers that be, number one, and also being an example of it. So I, I last summer, you know, we had an empathy boot camp. You know, we went to the Met and we showed them art, talk, speaking about the importance of art, and we talked about perspective. But I had the whole class before me and I took that as an opportunity to talk about tone of voice, which I think is part of communicating and sets the tone and sets that atmosphere. You know, when you, when you talk to your newborn, um, what's, what's the voice they hear? Good morning, how are you? How did you sleep? So they learn from the first earliest age to trust that voice. That's a trusting voice. You're going to trust that. And the opposite. If it's coming with a tone that's tough and, and um, you know, they don't trust it. And I, so I talk to them about tone of voice, even when you're tired. That it's so important for creating a, a, an atmosphere of empathy for each other and kindness. And also, it's these days, people are so often coiled, ready to strike. Like, I dare you to say something wrong. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And just... Be uncoiled and ready to listen. Yeah. And John, we have a similar program, the Heart of Medicine. 85% of staff coming into that said that they felt stressed, mm -hmm. high level of stress and burnout. And it flipped, right? As they left, they said 80% said that they felt little to no stress, right? Yeah. That they felt 85% more connected to their peers that they went through. And like 98% said they wanted more. I want to know more of right, what yeah. our programming can do for me. All right, so we have 10 minutes left. We're gonna pass the mic around. So, um, and, and Lori, you're gonna go first since you're right here. And Hi, um, I'm Lori Tish. And first of all, Jonathan and everybody, this was a phenomenal program. Thank you. Um, my question is to Eric. Um, well, and also I wanna thank all of the providers. I am a New Yorker. Some of us even gave resources um, during the pandemic, but none of us did what you all did. Um, so, I think it can't be said enough to thank you all for what you've done um, during the pandemic. So, Eric, we, we worked uh, pretty closely on, um, on the uh, Healing Walls program, which was teeny, teeny, teeny 
piece of what you did during the pandemic through um, the health and hospitals. And if I remember correctly, you had a third child during that time. Um, I think you said you had to sleep in the basement because you know, everybody was afraid of the contaminated clothing. Um, the subways were a mess. I didn't realize how much you disliked the subways to begin with, but even worse then. So my question to you is how did you relieve stress? <laughs> I know that you were under tremendous stress um, every which way. So I'm just curious as a friend how you act, because I thought about it yeah. during the yeah. pandemic. I know how hard you all worked and I'm wondering what you personally did. No, thank you, Lori. Uh, it was a tough time. Um, I did isolate from the family for two months. I got to visit my girls through a glass door between mm. the basement and upstairs. So I have some of those pictures with their hands and their faces against the window. Um, and I realized how much family was that support system for me. And so that was the hardest two months. Once my wife went back to work after maternity leave, she was also a physician in OB. Um, and I had a negative uh, antibody test. Figured we there's no reason to isolate anymore. And so that really helped me recover. But even with that, um, there was a point in, in the fall of 2020 where my boss said, I don't want to see you for two weeks. Mm. It wasn't until Good for a week your boss. into it that I realized that I had been in the red, the red line on your you know, odometer or yeah. whatever in the car, uh, revving in the, in the red line for, at that point, you know, six plus months straight. And, uh, Right, so I didn't even see it. I was so busy focusing on, on helping others uh, heal and then supporting our staff that I didn't, I didn't recognize it in myself. So, right, or none of us are perfect and I, I couldn't, couldn't even see it. So. That's such a poignant image of your hands on the glass. And of course, what AI and Zoom can't do is this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. And that's, that's good the leadership. Of human touch. Right? He understood what you needed and yeah. made it happen. We have another mic over here. What's your name? Hi, I'm Perry Roshager. I am from Texas. And I just wanted to put out one more um, wonderful tool, I think, that exists that is, it comes out of the Center for Depression Research and Clinical Care at Southwestern Medical School, UT. Um, Dr. Trevetti's work, and they have, it's now available to anyone. It's called Evexia. And it is a tool that will email you and text you every month and have you do an anxiety and depression questionnaire and it just gives you a score. And what a I good just idea. think that's a great way to kind of know where you are because sometimes I think when we get busy or we're in the thick of it, if you haven't experienced it, you don't, you don't know if you need help. So. I love that so much. We, we take our, our cars in, we check the oil, we check the gas. Is there enough windshield wiper fluid? But do we do that for ourselves? Sometimes we need, like you, to have your wheels rotated and you know, the whole thing. Carburetor checked. Um, any uh, in, the, in the back? Go for it. Uh, pl please say your name, where you're from. <laughs> uh, Umer Shah, Secretary of Health for the great state of Washington. John, great to see you again from yeah. Houston, Harris County. Um, I wanted to uh, ask the question really about, and I love this as a 20-year ER doc, uh, it's, it resonates so much about this real challenge of individual healthcare providers and their behavioral mental health and their emotional health. I wonder and I'm curious about how does this translate to population health perspective? How do you all see this transitioning to this, this crisis that we have in behavioral health and, and emotional health across the system? How can these strategies, apps, these ways of looking at the world help really translate and transform what we're trying to do across society. Thank you. David, that's probably for you. Yeah, yeah, no, I, and thank you for that question. And I think it's, um, and it's becoming, um, it's becoming even more important as we think about what's gonna happen with screenings going forward. So as the US Preventative Task Force comes and says, we have to implement screenings for folks from eight to 65 and uh, around anxiety and depression. And I, I believe most people will raise their hands, you know, saying, uh, I feel anxiety, I have depression. And then what, then what are the choices uh, that are gonna happen from there? And ultimately you have two, you, have, you either have to go to some form of therapy or there's medication, as we all know. And so part of what we're trying to do in the general population world, and even here at Com, uh, I'll tell you is, we started off as a direct-to-consumer company and we recognized there was this huge need globally. 
We then recognized that many employers were also raising their hands, not just as a benefit, but also saying that we need programs to help our employees because we're finding that um, you know, when they can't sleep or when they're having uh, issues, that it's, it's affecting their workforce productivity. And now we're partnering with payers and providers going forward, utilizing the brand, the trust, and saying, how do we get people uh, to now adhere to different programs following your clinical care pathways? And so we're going to need to think about how we use these tools at a much broader state going forward, um, because it's really also hard to discern from the sea of apps and all the different technology that's out there today. There's also a lot of studies out there where most people, uh, there's so many apps and it's so easy to create applications with technology. Uh, it's a little bit of also a double-edged sword. Um, some of these applications are not based on any uh, evidence-based uh, types of care. They don't actually help you get healthier. And so, you know, you're taking a real crapshoot in terms of the types of products you're trusting. And also with the proliferation of social media, many people are taking their social cues from TikTok, which also has, uh, you know, mixed results. Crazy. Uh, um, and crazy ideas. And crazy <laughs> ideas that we've all yeah. seen. So we need to go figure out how we create really trusted environments that yeah. you all support. Because if you support certain types of technology in the doctor, we've seen it. If it comes from your doctor or your nurse and says, this is the application you should go trust, that willingness to download goes from like 10 to 15% to over 50%. And so there's a real trust element that has to be built in there as well. And you know, for me, so much of the pressure that I've put on myself when I felt tense, it's not been in the interaction with the patient, it's been the multitasking pressure. It's like, oh, there's five people waiting and I've got to do this, I've got to do that. And something my mother taught me, which has come, really has helped me over the years. Um, when, when I was a kid and she would go to peel an orange, she would hold the orange in her hand and she would say to us, me and my three sisters, at this moment, this orange has never seen the light of day. And then she would peel the orange. So this orange, this moment, I mean, now it would be called mindfulness. Back then it was just my mom peeling an orange. <laughs> but I think that is something that we can do for ourselves. It's just one of those tricks when you get in that thing of just, okay, this moment right now, where you take a deep breath. Can I take 30 seconds? I'll Absolutely, stop. and we have 24 left, 24 so go seconds. for it. Okay, so I, all of you will get a copy of this book called uh, Healing Walls. This is our community mural project. We did 26 wall murals across our system, uh, finding artists, having focus groups with the community, with staff, with uh, patients, um, telling us what they wanted to see on these exterior and interior walls. Paint parties, here they are. Paint parties, paint parties? Yeah. And thank you so much, all of you. A huge thanks to physician and chief medical correspondent for CBS News, John LaPook, for hosting this Healing the Healers discussion live at Aspen Ideas Help with Northwell Health Nurse, Director of Perioperative Services and choir member, Winnie Mealy, Emergency Physician, Senior Vice President and Chief Quality Officer for New York City Health and Hospitals, Eric Way, and David Coe, CEO of Calm, a company who wants to be with you every step of the way in your mental health journey. And special thanks to the team at Aspen Ideas Help for permission to share this conversation, highlighting the creative and necessary approaches to supporting the health and well being of our healthcare workforce. To find links to this video and all the Aspen Ideas Help sessions, check out our show notes at cunowpodcast.com, where you'll also find additional resources shared during this conversation. And next summer, make plans to join us live in Aspen. Take it all in and add your insights and ideas to Aspen Ideas Help. Coming up in our next episode. I'm very proud to see so many of you here. <laughs> Makes me proud. As we are coming up on our 100th episode, we felt like we needed to do something that really honored the milestone of getting to 100. No one knew exactly how it started or who set it in motion. But in the spring of 1929, suddenly, inexorably, nurses at Seaview Hospital began quitting. Some cited the chronic mental and physical toll their job demanded. 
but most were leaving to escape tuberculosis, the Great White Plague. We are bringing the history to life of two amazing women, Virginia Allen, one of the last surviving black angels who helped cure tuberculosis, and Maria Smilios, author of The Black Angels, the untold story of the nurses who helped cure tuberculosis. The name came from the patients. They used to call the nurses their black angels. And what better place than to be in a place of trailblazers and change makers and pioneers and to hear the story of someone who represents that, who helps us to understand what we are capable of, what we have done, and what we should be continuing to do. I really feel loved. God bless you, all the work you've done. This is amazing. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.